All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Small Business Solution Series Workshop. We have a great topic with um, today, um, seven talent trends that may impact your team and business um, with Kevin McWhorter. Very excited about that. And we also are very grateful to our sponsor, Hawthorne Farm Athletic Club. And with us um, from Hawthorne Farm Athletic Club is Heidi Sivers, who has a brief presentation for us. Good morning, Heidi. Uh, good morning. Let me uh, go ahead and share here. I'm just going to let a little video run while people join us. Excellent. Good morning, everyone. My name is Heidi Sivers Boyce, president of Hawthorne Farm Athletic Club, proud sponsor of the Hillsborough Chamber Small Business Solution Series. Our local, family owned, and independent business is a wellness community based out of a beautiful 68,000 square foot facility right across from the Hillsborough Chamber at the Hawthorne Farm Max Stop near the Intel campus and Hillsborough Airport. For my team and I, the intensity of the last year only serve to strengthen our resolve to stay healthy, healthy ourselves, healthy as a team, and healthy as a business, as well as our resolve to share what we do with others and specifically other business leaders. No business solution will last if you aren't taking care of the people behind it, and that includes yourself, in addition to any team you might have. We small business owners and leaders are notorious for putting our own well-being behind that of our clients, employees, and the others who depend on us. But you know, taking care of yourself will give you the energy, ability, and endurance you need to take care of everyone else and everything else. So this is just a regular reminder. In today's tech and delivery-based, high-stress, convenience-food reality, the basics of self-care require an intention that they simply haven't before. At Hawthorne Farm, we talk a lot about finding your fitness enablers. The people, the habits, the tools, the resources, that help remove obstacles to your wellness, supporting and encouraging you in staying healthy in a regular way. For today's Wellness Minute, I want to address our immune systems. If you haven't heard, uh, perhaps you can hear it a little bit in my voice right now. The rage sweeping the nation is the common cold. The New Yorker is calling it the pandemic after the pandemic. As people drop masks, gather and touch shared surfaces again, the sniffles, coughs, and sneezes are back with a vengeance. We can use this as additional motivation to keep up our immune systems. Practice those core healthy habits that help us um, have strong immune systems, manage our stress, and keep going. Right now, this beautiful Oregon July is making getting back to basics uh, kind of tempting. So I have just a few reminders here for you today. The first is encouragement to get out and get some sunshine. That vitamin D boosting, wonderful sunshine. It's been beautiful this week. Make sure you're feeling the sun on your face, if only for a few minutes each day. You know I'm going to remind you about getting daily physical activity. So why not go for a twofer and get sunshine and exercise, whether it's going for a walk, a run, uh, swimming outdoors, even doing outdoor yoga. There's tons of options where we live. Just find those small, sustainable ways to get a little bit of activity in each and every one of your days. I'm going to encourage you to drink lots of fluids, water, and uh, anything without caffeine or added sugar. Add a little bit of extra fluid right now to keep well hydrated and flush things out. One of the best immunity-boosting habits you can have is to eat a plant-rich diet in a range of colors. And our beautiful Oregon produce, the Hillsboro's Farmer's Market, offers an incredible way to get uh, immune-boosting antioxidant vitamins like A, B6, C, E, plus uh, iron, folic acid, and of course, uh, zinc. Zinc is great if you're warding off a cold. Whether it's purple cabbage, red and blue berries, pale orange peaches, or the rich greens, Carve out time to explore the produce in our area and get some in your diet each and every meal if you can. And finally, let's keep up those habits we all learned well last year, washing your hands, staying home if sick, not going to the club uh, this week. In case you were wondering, um, staying closed in my office by myself. Keep up that mask wearing if you have any concerns at all. I always like to close the Wellness Minute with a reminder to have some fun. Whatever makes you smile, brings you joy. 
do that. Um, I know we all know these basics. That doesn't mean we don't need reminders and encouragement to actually implement them in daily practice. If there's anything that we at Auburn Farm Athletic Club can do to help, please let us know. Thank you so much. Heidi, thank you so much. And ending your presentation with a chaise lounge by the pool, super tempting. So thank you so much for that uh, relaxing and re and the great reminders about how we can really take care of ourselves. Truly appreciate, truly appreciate Hawthorne Farm Athletic Club's support of our small business solution series workshops. So now it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce Kevin McWhorter. Kevin is with Dale Carnegie and Associates and has a great presentation for us today seven talent trends that may impact your business or team. Kevin, welcome and great timing. A lot of people are talking not only about how to increase workforce, but how to retain the people they have. Yeah, and, and uh, one of the things that we do in Dale Carnegie is in any presentation, we wanna make sure everybody feels comfortable using Zoom because we ask you to participate a little bit in our program and so, if those of you that aren't familiar with Zoom, this will be a, just a quick, brief, you know, overview of how to use some of the features. Those of you that are very skilled in Zoom, you got this. <laughs> so uh, we have four ways to communicate. We have uh, the reaction button, and when you click on that reaction button, you should see these fun emojis. You can raise your hand. I might ask you, you know, which one of these do you like? Put, you know, do you agree with that statement? Or you don't agree with that statement? Give me a thumbs up, clap, tears. If you don't see these down at the bottom of your screen, that means that you're on an older version of uh, Zoom and you can click on participation, participants, and you'll see these same emojis. You don't have all the fun ones that we do, but you can use those and still respond um, by clicking on those. Uh, chat. Chat is a function down in the far right uh, corner. If you hit the chat at the bottom of the screen, you'll come down to the right side and you'll see everyone. And there's a little down arrow. If you click on that, you can send a message directly to me or individual people or everyone. Over on the far right, if you want to save chat at the end, you can click this, but Deanna's uh, you know, saving this uh, presentation, so we won't need to be able to do that, so you don't have to worry about it. And then finally, view options. We're gonna have you annotate a little bit in this presentation. So if you go to the top of your screen, you'll see view options when I'm sharing. You click on that and it pulls down a screen and you go to annotate. When you click on annotate, you'll see this little mouse bar that says mouse, text, draw, stamp. And we're gonna be looking at text and stamps mostly. Uh, probably won't do a lot of text today, but if you do hit text, you go to the screen, you'll see a box show up and you can type in it. And then when you hit enter, it shows up for everybody. So just a quick overview on uh, Zoom. So let's go into our presentation. Uh, seven talent trends that could possibly affect your team and your business. Uh, we are seeing, you know, through client projects and research conducted by uh, Mark Marone, a PhD who leads our thought leadership team for Dell Carnegie. He's been doing this research across the world, not just in the United States, but in all locations across the world that we are in. in. And we're in about uh, 30 countries um, right now, or excuse me, 90 countries, and we teach this program in 30 languages. And he's been talking to organizations about some trends and seeing seven common trends that affect large businesses down to small businesses. And so that's what this topic is about, is these trends that are coming, you know, that might have already started to impact your business or might be impacting it in the future. A little bit about us, uh, we've been around for 108 years. Uh, October will be our 109th year in business. Uh, 200 offices globally across the world, like I said, 90 countries. We teach it in 30 languages. We're in all 50 states of the United States. And we are ISO certified since 1998 in our product development and trainer development. And if you know anything about ISO, that's the International Standards of Operation, our programs and our trainers are taught the same way anywhere in the world. So trainers have to go through the same certification process in China, in Europe, in America. Um, also, all of our programs are the same in every country except for language and how we adapt to that. So kind of our global footprint a little bit so you can see who we are and where we're at. We're pretty much anywhere and everywhere you can imagine. 
and here are the seven talent trends. And so when I talk about these, we're going to you know, go through these in more in depth, but I want right now, if we can, put a stamp by the one just by, based off of the sentence here that has maybe started to impact you a little bit. So go up and hit the stamp bar and just put a check mark or an arrow or whatever one. Okay, yeah. So, Brad, come off uh, mute real quick and tell us why number three. What is it that has affected you in that uh, um, area? Uh, just that we are, it, for the last year and a half, it seems like just when we think we have things figured out, we have to change, um, which is probably the same for every business. Um, but we're trying to look at it through a positive lens instead of a negative of, uh, you know, the first six, eight months, it was more negative of what, what's going on, what do we have to do? And now it's more like, what have we learned from this? What can we benefit going forward uh, it, to, to better our efficiencies in our business? Yeah, yeah you know, we, we hear that a lot. So, I mean, it's, how do we keep agile? I mean, you know, a lot of things are changing in the world, you know, technology, you know, being resilient to change and adapting to it, looking at it as positive, not negative. Uh, someone else from uh, live online virtual training. I think it was Matt. Matt, what was uh, that one that, you know, what's an issue that you're having in that area? I wouldn't say it's so much of an issue as it's something that we've switched to almost completely. Yeah. Um, so everything is now online and live training for us. And, you know, we may do some hybrid events soon, but, you know, right now we're still live online. <laughs> live online yes so we're gonna dive into these a little bit and we're gonna look at this first one here um, after I clear all the annotations and you know managing a hybrid workplace that engages inspires and you know as Matt just said uh, you know we are online and now we are starting to move back offline and the issue has been you know some companies still have a hybrid workplace they, how do you engage those people? You know, some of them are working from home, some of them are working at the office, you have meetings that are online with half and half, and how do you keep the people at home feeling like they're part of the team, that they have access to the managers, they have, you know, input on the meetings, and what do we do to drive that? You know, so we have to reacclimate our team to that new, Kind of environment some organizations are bringing everybody back 100 percent some are still doing 50 50. you know one of the companies we work with is three days in two days out and they rotate it so how do we engage those as they go in and out so uh, hybrid um the second one is you know this is kind of changing across the world and i believe you know what Dale carnegie believes is that this is going to still be here and we're not going to go back to the old selling style where we fly across the country have a meeting you know with somebody talk about what they want to do set up you know some ideas come back and go back and forth and companies are looking at their expenses and realizing that this might be more productive by doing this on a Zoom call or Teams and starting that conversation. And then when you get to the final point of where they want to buy, we maybe go out there and do that. And so that has changed a lot and drastically. And even for small businesses, it's small businesses that just do business here locally in the state. Are you going to drive three hours to go meet a client that potentially may or may not buy? Or are you going to set up a call online and set a you know tone and start to build that trust and when we do that how do we build that trust online how do we gain that connection because it's a different skill set to build trust in person than it is online the next set of principles oops that is number three is lead continuous change to foster agility and resilience and brad was talking about this um we as leaders, we need to continue to 
create an environment where people are agile and resilient. Even as we come out of the pandemic, we are still seeing the constant changes around us, both internally in our organization and externally to our environment. We need to help employees to continue to build resilience and motivate and adapt and be able to go through. Um, number four, <laughs> thanks Matt, <laughs> I don't like that. Influence without direct authority. This is a, you know, something that has really changed because of COVID. And what happened is a lot of organizations had to flatten their management line. And so you might not be talking to your direct manager anymore. You might be talking to the vice president of marketing who doesn't have a lot of time to communicate with you. And he would like you to just resolve those issues. So how do you connect with the production department if you're marketing saying, hey, we're gonna put out this promo and it's gonna get us a lot more sales. Are you guys ready for this? Because we wanna start this tomorrow. And we have no influence or authority over the production department because we're not their boss, but we need to connect and we need to be able to have that connect, you know, cooperation from each of these departments. Manufacturing, communicating, you know, with product design, telling, you know, product design, hey, this design that you've created is costing us an extra six hours in production. Is there a way that we can, you know, reduce that time? So looking at these and understanding that, hey, the level of management has come down drastically because of COVID, and it might, you know, go back up or it might not. Um, enhance employee experience and well-being, and you know this is one of the biggest one. This is stress, and you know, companies are talking about this right now. You know, life, work balance. You know, making sure that our mental health as well. And a lot of people, a lot of our employees have had to take on extra tasks or extra you know duties that they didn't do in the past because of COVID, and they haven't really replaced those people yet because they're still building the revenue stream and stuff. So what do we do? How do we engage those employees that are close to being burnout? How do we keep them from being, you know, have mental issues or get too stressed where they leave the organization? And you know, one of the other things that uh, we looked at is some of the employees are actually doing things that they don't even know how to do because they don't have the talent or the people in the position to do that. Obviously, uh, number six, diversity and inclusion. Uh, to build the cultural awareness and competence, it's very valuable. And this comes down from the leaders. The leadership has to build the culture of a company. Whether you're a small business, big business, medium business, you set the you know culture of diversity and inclusion and make them feel people you know comfortable in a workforce and that even goes with the mask no mask a lot of people are upset about the fact that they have to still wear masks at work you know medical offices still have to wear masks there's employees that don't like that and they don't want to wear a mask in the office so how do you manage that how do you you know you know one employee's mad because this employee is wearing a mask or this employee is not wearing a mask. How do you manage that and build a culture where it's okay for everybody to do what they want and to recognize diversity in the uh, office environment? The last one is, you know, live online virtual training. And Matt kind of, you know, talked about this. A lot of training has moved to being online. And not just online, but live online. The old method of having, you know, online recordings and trainings is good, but how do you coach somebody? How do you build a skill that uh, somebody can take and work and use and put into practice in the workforce? And this is, uh, you know, really changed a lot, you know, because of, you know, what we can do online. Del Carnegie, back in January of 2019, saw the impact that this uh, virus was having over in China. And we got together and immediately started changing our format and how we deliver our training program to a live online virtual training. We've been doing it for 12 years, so it wasn't something new. It was just we were moving a bulk of our training to online because of the virus, and we knew that this was going to affect our industry. So we had a kind of a jump on it and looked at that. So the issue with all of these is engagement and you know in difficult times engagement is really flat and you can read this article in the new york times magazine by uh 
the CEO of, it's called Humanize. <laughs> and he said that this is really one of the biggest issues. And two weeks ago, we had Ashley from Arnell Recruiting uh, Services on talking about that she actually had an employee that came to her to be replaced into a new company, pick, took a same position, took the same pay, pretty much same benefits and everything. The only reason that they changed was because their company that they went to allowed them to work from home instead of working in the office. So how does this impact all of us? So looking at these, you know, seven trends, and we just talked about it, um, in the chat, is anything changed or anything that you didn't you know observe when we first started this now that kind of resonates with you that this might be uh something that you're going to have to deal with here in the near future Lighten them up. So somebody come off uh, uh, mute and just tell us one of the things you shared. Uh, I was typing. I'm a slow typer. So I'll just say uh, the one thing that is going to be interesting, I think, is the it kind of is the, the live online trading and kind of not of how are we going to broach the subject or make it a, you know, seamless transition into four or five people in, in the room live with four or five or six people online. Um, you know, it, 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 say for instance, a meeting with Matt who's in, in Canada, how do we make it so that Matt feels like he's part of the meeting with the group that are there rather than just a bubble on a screen on the side of the, on the wall. So I think Zoom is great technology, but I think that, that it needs one more step um, to make the full hybrid work from home uh, work seamlessly so i just i'm, I'm interested to see how that pans out yeah. and i think you know entrepreneurs will figure out a way to make that work so and we're hearing a lot of that uh, we actually started doing that um about six months ago where we have half of our program in person and half online and company you know offices all across the united states have been sharing and developing new ideas and concepts to help us use the tools that are out there and you know, you said something that's really important, Brad, is Zoom. People use Zoom to adapt what they want to do on Zoom instead of making Zoom fit to what they want to do. And that's what we need to do. And we show people how to take some of these formats and adapt it to their style. You know, what do you want to do? Here's, you know, one of the programs that best fits us and looks at this. So taking a look, um, at uh, some of the options that we have in you know we have four areas that uh, we look at you know for training and development and some companies do all four of them some companies do specific ones and it just depends on what you are looking at and you know what your need is um, typically you know phase one is building confidence and relationships if you have you know a team that hasn't been working together how do you build their confidence and trust in each other and gain cooperation? And so phase one is taking that step and looking at that and helping you build that, you know, camaraderie in the office and online, you know, if you still have coworkers that are working from home and how do you inspire those workers at home and those in, in the office? Phase two is our organizational leadership. And we talk more about leading ourselves. This is the hardest person, you know, person to lead is ourselves. How do we manage our um, schedule? How do we manage all the tasks that are coming at us? And when people are coming to us and having, you know, bickering and arguments, are we the peacemaker? Do we have time to be the peacemaker or do we need to do that? So we're looking at those leadership interactions that how do you engage your team? How do you motivate them and give them the authority to make decisions that don't are major, you know, um, affect the business, but make some minor, you know, affect the business. Give those, um, you know, delegate is what I'm looking for the word. Delegate some of those responsibilities to other people. Phase three um, is the influence. It's, we have to be able to sell our ideas, not only to our bosses, but to our customers when we're selling, you know, products and ideas. You know, Matt does uh, 
the audio and online you know stuff how does he sell those to his customers and selling online versus selling in person is two different skill sets would you agree matt and how do we change you know when we're online to when we're in person how do we change that and build those skills so that when we do make those presentations they come off impactful and meaningful and people understand them and then the last set is uh, leadership presence and this is just you know being aware of who you are as a leader being your vision how do you sell your vision to the employees of your team and make them feel like they're part of that vision and how do you visit you know vert facilitate those virtual meetings that everybody feels you know qualified that they're all part of the meeting one of the ideas that we talk about a little bit is have the people online lead the meeting have the people next week that are in person lead the meeting rotate it you know every week make them feel engaged so that everybody's a part of this until the whole workforce is backed in person so this is uh in, in one of the uh, things that we look at and before we go into this, we had a study that we did on the three levels of engagement, and we weren't the only one. Uh, Towers and Blessings, um, Gallup, and a few other companies did the same um, survey and looked at what are the levels of engagement in an organization. And there's three levels. There's the partially engaged, fully engaged, and disengaged. The fully engaged are those people that are excited to be there. They go out, they put into action ideas, they have great ideas, they work hard, they stay late, and they really want the organization to be successful. The you know partially engaged people are great people, and this is usually the bulk of our um, operation of our employees. Those are the people that you know love to work where they're working. They're there nine to five. They'll do whatever you ask them to but they're not really you know, risk takers. They just do what they need to do to get the job done. And then the disengage. And these aren't saboteurs of the company. These are just people that you know, complain a lot and we call them whiny sucky babies. <laughs> they look at the clock and they say, okay, it's 440. My boss told me I need to do this project. It's gonna take me till 530 to get this done. Now I'm gonna go disappear and do it tomorrow. You know, None of us have any of those, right? <laughs> Um, so how do we engage those people and create those whiny sucky babies or disengaged people into engaged or fully engaged? It talks about, we drove down and dug deep and we looked at some drivers that drive engagement. The relationship with your immediate manager. This is one of the most important in the belief in senior leadership. Those are two go in hand in hand and depending on the study you have, those are usually the top two is if I do not have satisfaction with my immediate manager, then I'm probably disconnected. I feel like I'm not, you know, valued. I'm not confident, you know, that my manager has my back and I don't feel like I should be part of the organization. I want to go start looking for it. Perfect example of that was, you know, the Alicia telling us about the employee who left to another company just because of being able to work from home online. How do you engage those people to make them feel part of it? And it goes to the direct manager, the relationships between the two of them. And then senior leadership. They have to believe in the, the leadership of the company. Dale Carnegie, you know, we changed uh, CEOs a few years back and our CEO has come out. He's gone through the training process to become a trainer for our organization. He's gone through the sales you know, process and done all the sales training and he truly comes out and wants to be a part of the organization. I've actually had several conversations with him and I'm low man on the totem pole. You know, CEOs and owners of companies need to be a part of their team, be able to talk to them, communicate to them, and let them know that they are there. They're not just that person that you can't reach. They are there and that they have a vision and they want you to be part of that vision. And then we have to have pride in our organization. You know, pride is we brag about the company. Where do you work? Oh, I work at ABC Company. It's the greatest thing in the world. Or instead of, oh, um, I'm in manufacturing. I, you know, do this and this. And yeah, it's an okay company. So if they're not, you know, pride in the organization, they don't feel a part of the organization. They're looking to leave. And balance, work-life balance. That was one of the other issues that comes up a lot. Is especially now with COVID, how much 
pressure have you put on your employees to produce and stay, you know, productive during the downturn of COVID? And, you know, you're losing employees, you've added work to them, what's happening to those employees? We don't want to lose more good employees, we want to keep them. And so we need to understand that balance. And then the work environment is the new one that's coming up a lot. And that's where millennials and the Gen Zs, they want to have an atmosphere where it's fun to work. And it's very you know easy to do that by building some engagements and having some fun activities on Fridays, you know, casual Fridays or silly Fridays, you know, doing some different activities and looking at some of those. This research, we've done this, you know, many times over the last, you know, 15 or 20 years, and we haven't seen a lot of change. These drive engagement. Every year, every generation that's come out, these are the ones that are impacting the engagement in our workforce and keeping employees where they want to work. And if you're able to do these, an employee is not likely to change a position for a couple dollars an hour. Now, if you came and offered them double their salary, I'd be the first to leave. <laughs> so this is, you know, something that keeps good employees where you're at. And we really dive in and focus in on how to build those engagements with your teams. So how clients engage with Dale Carnegie, we have the public live online and um, live programs. And this is, you know, if you're an individual, you only have one or two people in your office and stuff, you can come and attend one of these. These are public courses where we have multiple companies coming in, and they usually have two or three people in there. Some have just one. And it allows them to hear from other companies and other industries what they're doing in engaging. And our programs are more designed on, here's a tool, here's how we're gonna, you know, you know use this tool. How does this impact your business? What would you do with this tool in your business? And you hear it from all the people in the class, and you're learning more from the people in the class than you are from the trainer. The trainer's there just to facilitate the meetings. Private, you know, live online programs. Um, we can customize a program. We have actually 200 now uh, modules that uh, we can build and or you know design different training programs based on your needs. What do you need? So if you want your team to do this and they're spread out across the United States, great. We can do a live online program where we bring your team in together and have them do the training together. Or if they're all here in the same area, bring them together in one place and do the training there. And how do these things apply to that organization? Live online subscription, Del Carnegie Unlimited is our new system that just came out. We have a bunch of you know programs online that are two to four hours long. Some are even eight weeks long. And we can set you up on the Del Carnegie Unlimited subscription where you buy a number of seats, 20 seats, 30 seats, 10, 5, 4, whatever the um, number of employees are. And they get a design custom package on selling or on leadership or on management. It's whatever you want. And they can go online, take that anytime during the year. They're all live trainers and they're scheduled out, you know, six times a year so they can pick the one that best fits them. And when they complete it, they get a certificate that they've done it and then they go to the next program and the next one, next one. So we have that ability to adapt that to universities. You know, um, companies have these you know, universities of learning and stuff, so we have that ability. Um, any questions? I've talked a lot. <laughs> Kevin, we have a lot of comments in the chat. Do you want to maybe take a look at the chat? And, sure. um, I know Henry had a couple of questions and comments, and I think that will help sort of stimulate the conversation as we move forward. <laughs> maybe we can have a quarantine room. <laughs> yes. Henry, I'm talking about clients visiting our facility. It gets a bit sticky if we have not been vaccinated and we mandate that they wear a mask. And this is, you know, uh, Henry, one of the biggest issues that uh, we're hearing in a lot of the companies. Uh, one of our major companies is saying until everybody's vaccinated, everybody's wearing a mask. End of discussion. And anybody coming in, you know, the facility has to wear a mask. We don't care if you're vaccinated or not. And leaderships need to set that policy and be able to get everybody, you know, involved in it and say, yeah, OK, this is the right thing to do. Because the last thing we want to do is start saying, okay, that person's not vaccinated, so now we have to wear a mask. And that becomes a big issue. Um, 
anybody else on that one? Pull that up. You know, let's have some hear some comments on that. Well, I think it's also, you know, there's a struggle, right? You have, yep. um, uh, you know, the CDC that came out and said that, you know, their recommendation is that um, in the schools now that um, that they have universal mask wearing and um, and a week ago it was something different. And so schools are also trying to prepare, you know, not only the students, but their teachers and administrators um, and, and help them try to find what is the what is the what are the rules going to be and of course we're sitting at the you know July 21st and who knows what September 9th is going to look like and what will happen then so this ability for you know organizations to plan for and especially like a you know like a school setting you also had you know the hospital association and the healthcare workers as a you know, a group of employees that there was a conversation about how many healthcare workers across the state of Oregon are vaccinated, how many are not, what's the percentages, and the fact that, you know, they're not mandating uh, vaccinations. And so employers are kind of, I, in my mind, kind of looking at all of these things and, you know, where, where do they fall into that? Do they do a mandate um, for their employees of, you know, everybody's going to wear a mask until, everybody's vaccinated or only the unvaccinated and they're checking vaccination cards, which, um, you know, is also, you know, can be seen by some employees as sort of ostracizing them um, and, and holding them out as, and definitely, you know, the mark they're wearing is the mask. Um, and so it's a struggle. It's a real struggle. Um, you know, we're seeing the um, the new variant uh, take hold across the United States and many, you know, businesses and, and many states are talking about, you know, bringing back some of these mandates. And, you know, I do think that as we've sort of all got to the, you know, 40 to 50 and in Washington County, Washington County has one of the highest vaccination rates in the state of Oregon. Um, you know, we're kind of like, great, we're on, you know, let's move back, let's move back to full capacity, let's do all of these things. And you're starting to see some real issues happening with those. And so I, I feel like we've let our guard down on the vaccination sort of drumbeat, if you will, we need to get get back to that because not everybody's been vaccinated and that's causing issues. And then I think that, you know, employers are gonna have to, you know, take a look at where where they can weigh in on these things and what does that look like and, um, and, and making sure that they're, you know, looking at how they're um, impacting their employees, uh, that dialogue, that conversation, you know, if you're doing, you know, bringing people back to the physical space, these are decisions that employers are faced with. And if we, you know, enforce something and we have, you know, personnel that, you know, employees that don't agree with it, those are ones that are going to start being disengaged. And so as a leader, we need to come in and, you know, state the problem, state the issue that, hey, we have some people that are vaccinated, some people that aren't vaccinated. What do we do as an organization to make everybody feel safe and comfortable? And collaborate with your employees and let them be a part of that discussion. You know, one of the issues you talked about schools, the uh, special needs department, my wife works in that uh, department for elementary. You're not getting them to wear a mask. Those kids will not wear a mask. And so what do you do? How do you keep them from, you know, spreading it and doing that stuff? So those are issues that need to be addressed and have to do it in an engaging way that makes everybody feel like, okay, we were part of the decision, we all agreed to it. Um, I, I thought it was funny when I went into the eye doctor to have my glasses. They said we can't do the puff test anymore because the CDC says that puff is an air can cause an airborne disease to transfer to you. So we have to dilate your eyes with the old drops and do it the old method. And that takes 30 minutes, and you get to sit here for a half an hour. So I had to sit there for a half an hour extra while they dilate my eyes and do all that stuff. And it, I still have to wear a mask during this whole time. And then I get in. They said, "Okay, we need you to take your mask off so we can." test your vision so your glasses don't get fogged and everything. I was like, what's the point? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that goes to what Deanna's saying. So, Kevin, a couple of things that I've seen uh, from Oregon specifically from clients that we have in organizations. One of them is that there is a concern that companies are going to be breaking regulations like HIPAA if they say, 
well, Janet need, doesn't need to wear a mask because she has a medical uh, condition or something like that. So that's a concern. Another thing that we've seen, and I know that um, BNI of Southern Washington and Northern Oregon, they sent out a disclaimer and we had Ryan Corbridge read through the disclaimer and basically it was a waiver of all rights for yeah. going to their meeting. It wasn't just like mask or no mask. Like, you know, if you get COVID, it's not our fault. It was, if you get injured or hurt or sick in any way, it's not our fault. So there's also, you know, if you're gonna get somebody to sign a waiver, what kind of rights are people signing away when they sign a waiver like that, right? And how will so, it be challenged? You know? yeah, and how can it be challenged? Because if you are actually liable, signing a waiver is not going to do any good anyway. Right. And so we we are doing public classes now, and we're still, um, we make it optional for the mask, but when people come in, we ask them the questions. We say, have you traveled outside the United States in the last 14 days? And we take their temperature. And if they answer yes on that, we won't let them in the class. We take their temperature. If they have a temperature, we say, sorry, we need you to go home. So... <laughs> it's one of those things that we have to adapt and we have three people in our class out of 20 that are wearing a mask because they feel more comfortable wearing it and we're like it's totally optional it's what you feel most comfortable with someone else yeah, i think some kind of announcement for your company that you know if you want to wear a mask feel free to wear a mask you know and bring your own or we can supply one for you and i think those kind of things can go a long way same with your customers yeah. I know here at outdoor venues, like I was at the farmer's market this morning and they have a table with masks available, but you don't, there's no regulation that you have to wear it there. Right. But it says take one if you want one kind of thing. There's a couple of restaurants out in Hillsborough that I won't mention, but I've gone into them and they said, we require you to wear a mask unless you're willing to share with us that you are vaccinated and show us your proof. And so if you have your card, you can go up to the bar and they'll let you take your mask off. I mean, it's up your your choice. You want to share that information? Great. And that's how they get around the medical issue of privacy and HIPAA. I, I'm not an attorney. I don't know how close, how close that is to violating HIPAA. And I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but, you know, and Brad uh, you know, mentioned about how do we keep our good employees? We need to get them engaged in these decisions having them be a part of the discussion. How do you feel about this? What do you want to do to make it fair for everybody? And get the consensus. Because if we don't, we're always gonna have that one person that doesn't feel like they're a part of it and they're gonna leave over that. So, you know, we, we are working with a company right now where they have 50% of their employees working from home, 50% working in the office, and there's a big controversy. Why do they get to work at home? Why can't we go home? And we're you know going through these issues and trying to build that reengagement of how you know those work together. And some of the positions need to be here in the office. Some of them don't. And those that don't, you know, why aren't you letting them work from home? And how do you manage that? So, any others? Yeah. I I think it's going to be you know a challenge for the next few months at least of how you know, the employers navigate this, these controversial issues and, you know, definitely folks that are in the HR expertise space, as well as employ in employment attorneys, employer attorneys are going to be, um, you know, definitely high value in terms of getting their opinion. Um, and, you know, companies of any size that have, you know, um, a number of employees where it's not just one or two where they can have, you know, those kind of conversations where it's, you know, when you're getting into, you know, 40, 50 and beyond employees, you know, it's pretty tough to take consensus of the group and get, end up with anything, you know, at some point in time, they have to, you know, take counsel and have conversations with their, you know, with their um, professional advisors to, you know, determine what that's going to look like. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's just interesting to, 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 under, to trying to see it, how things are traversing and, and the, how things change every day, right? Um, right? And it's really depending upon how fast that Delta variant is spreading throughout your community and what that looks like. And, and then what the CDC is going to do sort of at the national level, um, because if you look at the numbers, you know, many states that 
didn't achieve 50 percent, you know, vaccination rates or are seeing really high cases of um, the, the Delta variant. And it's becoming, you know, again, a real crisis situation for the healthcare um, industry. So the CDC sees that they do ma mandates and then it impacts regardless. I mean, it becomes a national mandate that um, and all of us then have to, you know, understand and, and adhere to. And what does that mean for our economy? And it goes back to the trend about being resilient and uh, agile. We might have to go back to wearing masks for a little bit of period of time. Who knows? Right. You know, and how do you you know get your team that like they're so tired of it, they're ready to get rid of it and they're done. And now you're saying, hey, we got to wear them again. <laughs> so, I mean, these are the things that we are seeing affecting, you know, companies across the world. And there's no easy answer. I'm not going to tell you that, we, you know, though Carnegie has every answer to this, but we do help build that gap of engagement with your team where you let them be a part of the decision of what you decide as a policy for your organization on this, because it is going to be a hot topic no matter where you go. Anything is there, um, well, I was going to ask, I mean, aside from medical industries, is there any other industries that you can, you know, regulate masks for legally without getting in any trouble kind of thing? Well, the education, they're talking about schools. Um, right. My son's college is still hasn't, you know, U of O hasn't made a final decision on whether they're going to require students to wear masks in the fall. They are requiring them to be vaccinated, which, you know, I don't know how they get away with that, but I guess, right. you know, the schools, public schools were, you know, mandated that you have to be, you know, vaccinated with these, you know, uh, diseases for these diseases before you can start school. So I think they're relying on that issue. So. How do you deal with that? Um, Certainly a resurgence of all of the questions that, you know, we've been, like you said, I mean, there are certain um, diseases that schools require every student to be vaccinated for, you know, and now this is, is this going to get added to the list? And now, yeah, it's how do, how do, how do we navigate that? So here's a couple of funny things. This one, you know, um, on engagement, you can read it. <laughs> kind of ending our time here. <laughs> and then the, the next one. And this is, you know, this last one is the funny part about, you know, does anybody else have a suggestion that isn't ridiculous? Um, we need to be able to listen to everybody's ideas and not call them ridiculous because that is going to disengage our team. And, well, I'm not going to come up with an idea because he's going to call me an idiot. And by the way, for those who are legal ease, um, Gilbert and Scott Adams, who wrote Dilbert, um, is a graduate of Del Carnegie and has given us permission to use any of his comic strips in any of our presentations. So I do have permission to use those. <laughs> People go, you can't do that. <laughs> Any other comments or questions before uh, our time is up? we got about 10 minutes. I, I do think that there is going to be, um, you know, sort of uh, best practices of having a team that a portion is working remotely and a portion is working back in the office. Um, there's going to be some equity issues there. There are going to be some challenges and, in, in, you know, fostering productivity and, and work um, and team environment and how, um, you know, how that's rolled out and how those positions are determined. And especially, I will note, as traffic is now sort of um, back to almost pre-pandemic, uh, where now your commute is longer and, you know, I, I'm having to come back to work and I'm spending another, you know, 45 minutes of each end of my day commuting and I'm going to be much more productive if I stay at home. How does an employer navigate, you know, that dis distinguishing between what jobs need to be, you know, in person, what jobs need to be, uh, can be remote. Um, you know, we uh, months ago, we, we started hear hearing from employers that were doing, you know, a, um, they were, you know, reducing 
uh, salary for fo folks that were remaining remote. Um, and is that going to be the trend where, um, you know, there's a, a premium for in, you know, in-person uh, jobs? I, I don't know. I think it's all very interesting. And that's, you know, how do you keep both sides engaged? If you do right. allow people to work home and work, you know, how do you feel, make them both feel like they're part of the organization? The people at work can go and talk to the manager down the hall anytime they want to and they can find him. People at home can't. And, you know, the end one of the things that we're hearing from our New York uh, headquarters is that uh, a lot of the major 500, you know, um, companies that are in the, uh, you know, major 500 are actually giving up their leases. They found that it's more productive to have employees work from home. And so they're saying, why do we spend a million and a half dollars on a lease when we can have our employees work from home? The studies are showing they work longer because they don't have the drive and they're more, you know, focused and they stay late. And so they're getting more done. And, and there's always those employees that don't. And, you know, so, you know, which way do you go and how do you build those talents? And I, that's why I said these are challenges that are going to be facing us here for the next few years. And we just need to adapt and be agile and figure out the best solution for all. I'm done. I hope that was uh, informative and uh, you guys got some insight out of that. Job, uh, if you have any questions or you'd like to talk to me more offline uh, about something, I'd be glad to answer any questions. I'm always here to be a resource for small businesses. So, Excellent. Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us today. We truly appreciate it. Thanks for everybody um, also participating in the conversation. Take care. Have a great rest of your week.